Hey folks, I'm Dumotro. Welcome back to Combo Class, where today I want to tell you about a concept that many people confuse with infinity. Infinity is a grandiose, somewhat vague concept that can mean many things. It can mean just that something is endless in a way, or can be used almost like a number in certain branches of math. Although at that point, you do have to distinguish between different types of infinity, but both in a mathematical way and in just the general way humans talk about infinite things in society. Many times when somebody calls something infinite, they're not actually using the right term. They're describing something not quite infinite, but that has enough in common with infinity that they're often mistaken. A concept called being arbitrarily large. So today, I want to take you on a little journey through Blackberry patches, prime numbers, and card games to see some ways in which I think this concept should be taught more and used more in society. Here I am at a blackberry patch out in nature, and oh boy, do I love this blackberry patch. At the right time of summer, it feels practically endless. By endless, I mean that it seems like no matter how many blackberries I pick here, there will always be more left for the next visitor to have some blackberries of their own. As if no matter what finite number I chose to pick of these, there would always be at least one more. Now, in reality, of course, a blackberry patch can't be endless. There has to be something beyond it. But hypothetically, what if there was a blackberry patch where no matter how many I picked, there would always be more? Now, it might sound like I'm describing a hypothetical type of infinity, but what if there was a blackberry patch that wasn't infinitely large, yet had that property where any finite amount could be taken away from from it and there would still be more. This hypothetical blackberry patch can't exist in reality and it doesn't describe a concept like a single number either, but it does describe some actual mathematical phenomena, such as how many digits a prime number can have. Prime numbers like two, three, five, seven, or etc., are classic aspects of mathematics and reality. And let's say I asked a couple questions about these numbers. How many prime numbers exist? And how many digits can one of them have? Well, either of these questions in a casual sense can be answered by up to an infinite amount. But the actual technical answer is a bit different for these two. The amount of prime numbers can be described by infinity. It is accurate mathematically to say there's an infinite amount of prime numbers. It is a set of natural numbers where if I eradicated all the others and kept only those, there would be an infinite amount. But if I ask how many digits one could have, the answer isn't quite infinite. A prime number can have more than a million digits, more than a billion digits, more than a trillion digits. But we can't say that any individual prime number has an infinite amount of digits. They're a type of natural number, a whole number that has some finite amount of digits for each of them. And we can't describe a number in the system of real numbers as being prime, but having an infinite amount of digits. So the answer to the second question isn't quite infinity, but it is a similar concept. The answer is that a prime number can have up to an arbitrarily large number of digits. So what does it mean to be arbitrarily large? Well, this isn't a term that can describe a single number, but it can describe types of numbers and traits they have. When something is arbitrarily large, that means it can be bigger than any possible finite size you could choose to pick. 
but not necessarily infinite, like the amount of digits a whole number can have. If you send any finite number my way, I can find a whole number with at least that many digits. A whole number can have an arbitrarily large amount of digits, more than a trillion or a quadrillion or any of those finite numbers, but not quite an infinite amount. It may seem intuitive that we can have an infinite amount of certain types of whole number, like prime numbers, but that no individual example of a whole number has an infinite amount of digits. But some things in math are a little harder to figure out whether infinity or arbitrarily large would be the right term to use to describe them. To see an example of something that it took mathematicians many years to prove was arbitrarily large, let's talk about what are called arithmetic progressions. An arithmetic progression is a set of numbers that are equally spaced out on a number line, as if you were hopping the same amount down it a certain amount of times. They are the numbers that can all be written as A plus B times each N, ranging from zero up to however far you want it to go. A basically being your starting number and B being your hop distance. Like with the odd numbers here, those are numbers that are in in the form of one, one plus two n for n values starting from zero upward. And since we can make an odd number for any value of n there, and there's an infinite amount of options for that, the odd numbers are an infinitely long arithmetic progression. But what about arithmetic progressions within prime numbers? Let's circle the prime numbers on this little stretch of number line. The numbers that can't be divided cleanly by anything except for one and themselves. And what if we looked for places where prime numbers were equal hops apart? Well, we could find a little one here. Three plus two gives us five, plus two gives us seven. Those three primes fit a miniature arithmetic progression of three plus two n, just for the values of zero through two that we could plug into that n. But if we look harder, maybe we could find some more. Like if I take five and add six a few times, I get five, then 11, then 17 there, then I would get 23, and these are all prime so far. Plus six, 29, plus six, ah, uh, 35. That one's not a prime number. So five plus six n is an arithmetic progression of prime numbers for values of n between zero and four. But what if we wanted to find a longer arithmetic progression of primes? For example, if I took the prime number 199 and then added 210 and then some more 210s one at a time, well, this generates a prime for any n value between zero and nine, giving me a length 10 arithmetic progression. And maybe I would look further, like if I wanted to find an arithmetic progression of primes that was 14 in length, well, the small the smallest one turns out to be three, oh, three, one, three, eight, five, five, three, nine, plus 420,420N for N values between zero and 13. But could you find an arithmetic progression of prime numbers that was infinitely long? Oh, go, 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 go. Well, let's look at some of these cases of arithmetic progressions of some primes that eventually hit a non-prime composite number and see what went wrong with them. Well, 3 plus 2n works for 3 plus 2 zeros or 3 plus 2 ones or even 3 plus 2 twos. But if we get to 3 plus 2 times 3, that whole thing will definitely be a multiple of three. Three plus two threes. And that couldn't be a prime, a multiple of three larger than three itself. And in this case, a similar thing happens. 
5 plus 6n worked when we had 5 plus 6 zeros, 5 plus 6 ones, all the way up through 5 plus 6 fours. But if we get to 5 plus 6 fives, that's definitely going to be a multiple of 5. In general, an arithmetic progression of prime numbers could be written in the form a plus b times different values of n, so an infinitely long one of these would have to make this prime for n equaling 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and an infinite amount more of possible values. But something's going to go wrong when we get to the point when n equals a. Because even if all the previous values had been prime, at this point, this is going to simplify to a plus b times a, or a times 1 plus b, which must be a multiple of a larger than a, and thus couldn't be prime. So eventually, this arithmetic progression will have to hit something that couldn't be prime. That logic, along with a few more technical details, can prove that an arithmetic progression that's only prime numbers can't be infinitely long. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a maximum length. If you look far enough down the number line, you'll find arithmetic progressions of primes with more than 100 primes in them. And if you look far enough, you'll find ones with more than 1,000 primes, more than 1 million primes, almost as if there's no limit. And it took mathematicians a long time, but in 2004, the great mathematicians Ben Green and Terence Tao managed to prove that prime numbers can be in arithmetic progressions of arbitrarily long length. So there are no values of a and b where every n value would create a prime from this, but there are values of a and b where an arbitrarily large amount of n values in a row would work. More than 20 trillion in a row for one of these combos, more than 20 trillion in a row for another combo, bigger than any finite number you could pick, but not quite infinite. So arbitrary largeness is a very useful concept in number theory, but it also shows up other places in life. When I was thinking about which other places this concept had uh, shown up in my life, it made me think of a card game I used to play as a child. And when I looked it up again recently, it seems that it's still the most popular card game of a certain sort, and that there are still some major misconceptions among its players in terms of how they use the words infinite and infinity. And a lot of these problems could be fixed if more players just knew what arbitrarily large meant. So to explain all that, let me tell you a little bit about a game called Magic the Gathering and something in it that many players incorrectly call infinite combos. And you know that I am the exact type of guy who would love something called an infinite combo if players were using that term correctly. This game has had tens of thousands of different cards made over time with different abilities, and it would take too long for me to try and explain all of the rules to the game, but to super simplify it, players create a deck out of combinations of these cards, typically the deck needing to be at least 60 cards and you not being able to use more than four copies of the same one, unless it's a type called a basic land, which you use to charge up the cost to play things like creatures, which stay and play a while unless they get killed and go to what's called your graveyard, or to play other sorts of spells that have such a variety of effects. And typically, the way that you win this game is by dealing damage to their opponent and reducing their life total from 20 life down to zero. And sometimes you might just do that by slow and steadily attacking with a bunch of creatures and playing a bunch of little single spells. But at other times, 
You can find cards that work in such a good combination together that just a few cards on their own can win you the game right there. I remember being quite excited when I was younger, and this trilogy of sets called the Mirrodin block was coming out, and I realized that some of the cards worked surprisingly well together. This Mirrodin block involved a lot of the card type called artifacts, and one of the artifacts I had was called Croak Clan Ironworks. It let you sacrifice or kill any of your own artifacts, which didn't have to be itself, to get two colorless mana, sometimes pronounced mana, which was basically a cost that you could use to pay for other things. And I had an artifact that cost exactly two colorless mana called Mirror Retriever, which had the effect where if it died, it would let you return another artifact from your graveyard or dead zone back to your hand. And I realized that if I had this Croak Clan Ironworks in play, and I had two copies of Mirror Retriever, I could make a sort of endless-seeming cycle, where if I played one Mirror Retriever and sacrificed it, then I would have enough mana to play the other one, which I could sacrifice and get to return the other, having enough mana to keep playing them and sacrificing and returning them in a loop. And on its own, that won't do much just being able to keep looping a bunch of cards in and out of your hand. But if you combined it with certain other cards, like this Disciple of the Vault here, which says that whenever an artifact dies, your opponent loses a life. So with this in play, if you continued that loop, you could drain your opponent of all of their life even if they had had a thousand life or a trillion life. And as a kid, I was pretty excited to find that combination of cards. And when I looked deeper into it, I found that magic players do look for interactions like that and do call them combos, which is not where the name of this show came from, but it is one of many types of combo I've appreciated throughout life. Over the years of many cards being printed, Magic players have found many different combos out of those, and at one point in Magic the Gathering history, there was a time known as Combo Winter, when combo decks got more powerful than the game designers realized they were going to, and a lot of decks were using combos to win on the first or second turn. So the Magic game designers had to ban a bunch of cards from tournaments, and had to be much more careful after that when printing cards to look for if they were going to fit into some special combo. But over the years, many more combos have been printed and found, a lot of which players describe as infinite combos. Because you can continue some loop within that interaction as many times as you want. For example, here's a combo of two cards where one of them can tap or use itself up for the turn to create two mana or more, and the other one can spend one of those mana to untap it or let itself do that again, and that nets you one extra mana at least per time you do that, which you could continue as many times as you wanted, getting what some players call infinite mana to play whatever you wanted. You could also have combos that give you as many creatures as you wanted in play, like these two cards, or combos that just deal as much damage as you want directly to your opponent. A lot of players call these an infinite damage combo or infinite mana combo or whatever, but that's where the first misconception comes up, because if you read the right point in the long rules of the game of Magic, you'll see that you're not actually allowed to deal 
infinite damage to your opponent. You can't declare infinity as the number of how many times you loop one of those combos. The number infinity has been used jokingly in a few magic cards they've made in joke sets they make once in a while, but these cards here are not typically considered by players to be part of the main card pool. In the main game of magic, the infinity symbol isn't something that's allowed. And if I want to deal what seems like an infinite amount of damage to my opponent, I do actually have to pick a number and say, I deal a million damage or a billion damage. But does that mean that we should call that combo a million damage combo instead of an infinite damage combo? Well, no, because Maybe they have more than a million life. Maybe we need it to be a billion damage combo sometimes, or a trillion damage combo. And that's sort of where the second misconception comes in, is that even players who know that you're not supposed to call these infinite combos don't seem to realize that there is an excellent word to call them, arbitrarily large combos. And that's not even where the misconceptions end, because although the type of combo that most players call infinite should be called arbitrarily large, there are other types of combo in magic that do cause something to occur infinitely, and those, which could be properly known as infinite combos, don't do what a lot of players seem to think or realize. They don't win you the game. For example, when we were looking at a combo that could create an arbitrarily large amount of creatures, a very important word on one of these cards here is may. It says that you may do a certain action, meaning that when you've created as many as you want, you can choose to stop. But what about these two cards? This one right here says that whenever a land comes into play under your control, you generate a little creature. And this other one says that all of those creatures you have are also lands, meaning that that, that will count as another land coming, generating another creature, another creature, and the word may isn't on there. So you don't get to choose to stop. There will be more and more and more creatures. And if you look deep in the rules of magic, you'll see that if an interaction like this continues indefinitely and no player has something in their hand that they can instantly play to break that cycle, the game actually ends in a draw or a tie. So when many players refer to an infinite combo like some game-winning thing, they're using the term so backwards Words, and the actual type of combo that should be described as infinite are combos that players want to avoid because they don't win you the game. At best, they tie the game for you. So arbitrary largeness and infinity showed up in this card game I played as a child. And although I didn't look into many other games, I'm sure there are other games where players have similar misconceptions. Because in a game, it seems like an important concept that you might have some loops of sorts that can be continued indefinitely in an infinite way. Others that maybe could be continued indefinitely but need to be capped off at some finite number or another. And other that maybe have some finite maximum. And humans aren't great at automatically guessing or intuiting the difference between when something might be infinite or something might be arbitrarily large. Those are just a few out of many possible examples of places arbitrary largeness and infinity show up in reality and how humans can easily mistake those two for each other. Perhaps we need to spend a little more brain power looking out for times in which something we think is infinite isn't 
white. And in a future episode, we will look more at actually infinite things to see how mathematicians classify not just one infinity, but actually multiple types of infinity that come in a sort of hierarchy of sorts. Until then, keep your eye out for arbitrarily large things that might be tricking people into thinking they are infinite. All right, folks, thanks for joining me today in Combo class. Hope you learned some ways in which infinity might actually sometimes be describing something that's only almost infinite. And if you're a teacher, maybe tell your students about arbitrary largeness a little more often. And special thanks to my Patreon supporters who help make this show possible. And I appreciate all of you for watching. Love you all, and I'll see you in the next one.